uh, that uh, in, in natural discourse are necessary for our students to create grammatically correct sentences when they speak and write uh, with accuracy. So it's a challenge to say the least uh, working with uh, stress and reduced speech. I'm happy to see that other presenters are gonna get into this topic as well. So I, I'm not the only person, I'm just starting it off and there'll be other presenters also talking about this. I found in my experience that when teachers, the more pronunciation experience, the more uh, experience working with students on their pronunciation, generally the more they uh, gravitate to talking about uh, rhythm and teaching uh, phonology uh, through the lens first of, of rhythm. And I'll talk about why that is. But before we go any further, let's just see who's here because I neglected to greet everyone. Uh, I see Vanessa's here, that's Brazil, Dalel's here, uh, and Chaki's here from, uh, Dalel's here from Tunisia, and Chaki's here from uh, Yemen, and who else do we have? Can we represent some countries here? It's going so fast. I mean, oh, I see Mexico going by. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Lena's here from Colombia. Oh, I can't read names. What am I doing? I see Mexico, Greece, California, Morocco, Greece, Egypt, Egypt, Italy, Morocco. Wow, Serbia, Argentina. I'm trying not to repeat myself. Did I see Kazakhstan? I can't even see a Turkey. Yeah, we need more Turkish student teachers. So many wonderful teachers in Turkey we need to represent here. Canada's in the house. Algeria, Tunisia, Iran, Spain. Absolutely fantastic. So glad everyone's here. And uh, why do we call it shrinking in Lincoln? What's happening there? Is that the way we usually write? Do we say up and down? Do we say boys and girls? Do we say black and white? It's really difficult for me to say those, those collocations. Those are called binomials. I love those collocations, right? We don't say them that way, so why should our students be saying them any differently? We're going to talk about this uh, among other topics today. True or false, we want our students to feel stress. That's a true or false question for you. <laughs> Does anyone sense that it might be a trick question? Ah, why would it maybe be a trick question? Does the word stress have more than one meaning? If you go back to the class page and look at all that wonderful dialogue, uh, you see people talking about stress. They're not talking about this kind of stress, right? It is a trick question. The answer is true. We want our students to feel the rhythm. Of course, we don't want them to feel the ah stress, right? But we want our students to feel rhythm. And does anyone notice where I have given a little help here with the rhythm? Do we say we want our students to feel the rhythm? No. Right? The stress here is on students and feel. Good. Somebody said bold characters, bold font. Uh, in Facebook, if you know me from Facebook or Twitter, you know that I'm forever capitalizing letters to show stress. Uh, much, much better for uh, various reasons to do it with bold, I feel. So in my lyrics, if you know the lyrics I write for songs and chants, I do it with bold and I will do that here. That way, if you print it out, it's not color, and the capitals can get confusing with students trying to learn rules about capitals. So we want our students to feel the rhythm. Everybody try that. We want our students to feel the rhythm, right? Not the bad stress. We want them to feel the stress of the language. Because is the rhythm of English similar or different from most other languages? What do you think? Is there something unusual about it? There really is. Now, if you're thinking about, well, every language has some stress. Like I was just in, uh, in Mexico and I gave a, a, a talk at Next Tiso in Querétaro, right? So Querétaro has an accent mark to signify the stress, to mark it. But you need that in Spanish because otherwise you don't do it. English <clears throat> is not the same. 
as most of you know, because I was reading the class page, really great exchanges happening there. So you know that it's stress timed in nature. That is not common. Most languages are syllable timed. So you might have some stress, but you don't have it governing the language the way that you see it in most other languages. I tried to make it clear in my class description that the main main idea is the practice and the repetitive practice and that's where I'm coming from. I did say that uh, raising awareness is important. My point was that I think I said it this way, when raising awareness, like where do we put stress and this is how the language works and kind of explaining it to students, depends on their age, we'll talk about that. But when it's followed by the, re the repetitive practice, um, then it usually works. Absolutely more important, I believe, is not filling our heads with, our learners' heads with patterns and rules and this syllable, the penultimate syllable stressed and the initial syllable and learn these rules. But raising awareness, right, raising awareness to motivate students, to make it, oh, that's why English is, you know, getting them to this point, following this with techniques we'll talk about today, activities, that is often much more effective than just doing practice. So there is a fine line, right? <laughs> between raising awareness of pronunciation and raising what's that what's that picture of i'll give you a hint it's a word we've talked about today already yes stress but the bad one right <laughs> so uh we see this all the time where we think we're helping our learners by explaining things and you know giving them these rules rules that are usually rules uh, but it can really make them more stressed and overwhelmed or bored or both right so i want to make keep that in mind as we proceed today and to underscore that point <laughs> it's usually best to follow the three r's i think this is true in general with language learning and perhaps learning of anything um, but when we're talking about things like the rhythm of the language that we do not of course teach native speakers directly about that's a feature of the language that's going to be best uh, learned by just acquiring it through practice and thanks some of you know about the three r's thank you very much true or false hey what happened to my picture it was there before true or false the rhythm of english is i'm gonna to have to tell you what that is i'm so embarrassed i'd write it on there but my head i'll just tell you what it is the rhythm of english is three four i'll make sure that gets into the powerpoint three four do you know what three four is the time signature three four for example a waltz one two three two two three three two three four two three that's three four time four four time which we're very familiar with from pop music almost all pop music is one two three four yes the beat hello nevis <laughs> so three four true or false three four Now this is, I'm not saying that's a rule. Let's say it's best described as three, four, or people often talk about it as having three beats per measure. Of course, this is not music, but there's something we're going to see very musical about English rhythm. Well, let's look. Back to the bad stress again. When we take a sentence in English, a very basic sentence, right? What do we call that word, by the way, students? It's a noun, a plural noun, but in this sentence, in terms of syntax, what, what, is, it, what is that? What part of the set? That's the subject. That's the part of the sentence. Thank you very much. I just love seeing, look at all the subjects come. Come on, subject, 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 subject. <laughs> the chat box is alive and kicking. It's popping. It's banging. It's busting out everywhere. It's off the hook. It's off the chain. It's off the hizzy. Uh, now, if you're good, you're going to, anticipate my next question you'll be the first one to put it in who's going to try feel in this sentence 
is Tony I got it <laughs> number one it is the verb the main verb and what about stressed I know nobody's stressed doing this exercise because underneath these words I have written whether you've noticed it or not subject verb plus object or complement now my next question is this word order common in English? S V O. Is that a common word order in English? <laughs> Have you seen that before? Are most languages so strict about word order? Or in other languages, typically you can move things around more, right? Well, English used to be like that. Maybe some of you know that. It used to have cases like German, it's a Germanic language, structurally more than anything else. The cases, for different reasons, we don't have time now, that would be a great lesson, uh, not for me to do because I'm not an expert in that area, but uh, what happened to English with all the different influences and changes. But anyway, the cases disappeared mostly. Uh, there are a few left. Uh, as a result of that, word order, strict word order became very important because you can't just put a little ending on the object and move it somewhere and we know it's the object. So the word order is very important. We do have uh, other word order in English, but it's the exception and not the rule. For example, who can tell me? When do we move things around? And then we really notice it. What's the Questions. Passive for emphasis. Adverbs, negative adverbials, negative inversion. Never have I seen a sunset as beautiful as, right, this sort of thing. So it's, it's not the, the, the normal way that we do it. Well, I don't know if you know this. There is a connection, direct connection, between this new almost fixed word order in English and the rhythm of English. Did you know that? The pronunciation of English. And here it is, right? Because the language gravitates to this word order, the rhythm has become this three, this one, two, three. This does not mean that every sentence all the time is one, two, three, but it means that underneath, right, this rhythm is there. It's the backbone. It forms, and that's my phone. Excuse me, I'm trying to pretend it's not ringing, uh, but I'm not answering it. I know who it is, it's stupid salespeople or something. It's not important. The important calls come from somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, that's the landline. Who cares about landlines anymore? Uh, so, how do we pronounce this word? Well, the first thing we notice, and there was talk in the class class page about this, and I'm glad to see it, the difference between word stress and sentence stress. Word stress can also sometimes be called syllable stress, although usually word stress is is what we uh what we see in books at least i like talking about syllable stress myself because word stress could be confused with sentence stress so uh i want to distinguish between those and we'll do that with this word here students so in english unlike most other languages each word with more than one syllable has a syllable that is stressed now if you learned well, there's primary stress, and there's secondary stress, and tertiary stress. Please forget about those other uh, secondary, tertiary. What you want with your learners is to get them very familiar with figuring out from a dictionary, from listening, from your instruction, from highlighting it the way I'm doing, where that stress is. So we do not say students, and we do not say students. We say students. And what happens? Stu is stressed automatically then what happens to the other syllable do we say dents like i could have a dent in my car right a dent in a kind of thing of something i have a dent in put a dent in the wall that's dent but it doesn't sound like that in this word how about my name some students say jason jason well s o n is what son but my name is not jason it's jason right good thank you jason <laughs> that's why we have the schwa everywhere 
uh, in English because of this rhythm. Things reduce to that a uh sound or i uh sound so often the spelling and sound system makes us crazy and that's only one of the problems with the sound and spelling system. The most important thing as we I'm going to start say I'm going to say this is how do we show our students this without making them feel like how do we remember this? It's not remembering as much as hearing and getting familiar. You know, so that sounds right, that sounds wrong, right? That looks right, that looks wrong. That's what we're really going for. But depending on the age of your learners, some kind of awareness of the stress, maybe what I'm doing, maybe something else, I'll show you other techniques in a moment, can really sometimes help make them feel more comfortable. And then they can put that information back here and you can do a lot of practice and you don't have to talk about it again. If nothing else, I hope that what we're doing here informs you as a teacher. You may not use any of this information, especially if you teach young learners. You're not going to be talking to them so much about this. What happens when we add words? So we notice we have the syllable stress, students, and then the main verb is stressed and the object is stressed. What happens when we add grammar words? For example, we add an article, the. Well, we've added an extra syllable, haven't we? How many syllables are in the first sentence? S students feel stressed. Somebody tell me. Make sure everyone's following here. How many syllables are in the first sentence? The one, two, three, one. Students feel stressed. How many syllables? Three are stressed. How many total syllables? Four. So we know it's not students feel stressed, it's students right, feel stressed. When we add the article, the, what happens to the rhythm? Does it change? No. The students feel stressed. So when people say, do people say the, all right, that's the long, it's like dense, yeah. Those words exist, but in the context of a sentence where that rhythm needs to be maintained, they reduce. So we don't say the or the students, right? The students. So everybody try that. First me, then you. Ready? Students feel stressed. Now you. Now me. The students feel stressed. Now you. Ah, next one. How many syllables? How many words? The students are feeling stressed. So now we have five words. Some of you need some uh, math practice over there. <laughs> five words. You're English teachers, I know. Um, wink, wink. How many syllables? Five words, how many syllables? The students are feeling stress. Ooh, seven. Does the rhythm change? It doesn't change. Now, here is where I want to say something important, and this is also talked about in the, on the class page a little bit. I want to talk about rhythm versus speed. So when people say, if your learners say, or maybe you feel as a second language speaker, English is so fast, and that's why it's difficult to understand, of course, idioms and grammar, but when we're talking about pronunciation, that it's the speed. I don't disagree with you. I mean, I've had students uh, in New York City, and then they go to California, they're like, wow, people in New York speak faster, right? So speed of any language, when people talk faster, if you're learning it, it's going to be harder. But does the shrinking and linking happen because of the speed? So what I want to show you is, no, it's about rhythm, not speed. So I'm going to say this sentence very, very slowly. The students are feeling stressed. And maybe in real life, I would say it that way too. How are the students feeling? Mm -hmm. All right, you know, the students are feeling stressed. Even very slowly, it's students, sir. It's never, 
the students are feeling, right? It doesn't happen. So fast, the students are feeling stressed. Slow, the students are feeling stressed, right? Same thing happens we know in music. You can play something slow or fast, but if it's three, four time signature or four, four, that doesn't change, right? So we can have one, two, three, two, two, three, and one, two, three, two, two, three, and one, two, three. We can keep adding notes in music to the same rhythm. Just like here, what are we doing? We're adding words to the same rhythm. Another analogy is a suitcase, right? You can put more and more things in the suitcase if they're small, right? <laughs> so what we're doing, and then in the next example, we have the present perfect progressive or continuous. And maybe you're noticing something. Oh, in English, when the grammar structures get more complex, it's harder to hear those grammar structures. This is a very, very uh, important area, I feel, that I focus a lot on in my materials, right? That we need much more practice, especially slowly, but with natural rhythm for these uh, structures. Because you could have a student who's, you know, oh, I know the present perfect progressive. I can do the gap fill. I know I've been studying for this. Ah, I've been living here since blah, blah, blah. But when people speak with that natural rhythm of stress, it's hard to notice the present perfect and then it's hard to use it when you speak and write it with all those little grammar words that are so hard to hear. Our challenge then, and I'll, I hope I'll repeat this a couple more times, our challenge, how to make our learners very fluent, they want to hear the main words, right? How many of you tell your students that? Focus on the stressed words. The stressed words have the meaning. They carry the meaning. Let's try to listen for the words that are louder or longer. That's going to make you a more fluent listener. And if you don't discuss it, could be depends on your, your learners and, and their styles or their ages. But if there's a really hard, let's say, dialogue in a, on a sitcom or movie, and you notice the students are getting overwhelmed by all those little grammar words, well, which words are... You know, carrying the meaning. Students feel stressed. That's fluent listening. But those grammar words, to be able to produce sentences when we speak and write, we also need the grammar words, those auxiliary verbs and the articles. I'm going to demonstrate with you, we're going to do these together slowly. So I don't hear anything from anyone about, well, it's just because you're speaking fast. We're going to go very slowly. So in essence saying, let me just emphasize, they don't need to get all the words. Exactly. They may, in order to understand, they may have to tune out some words. But again, the challenge is how to be able to be as fluent and accurate speaking and writing with all those grammar words. Reading is very important because we see those grammar words for sure. And maybe some techniques that you can use and I'll show you which will help with a little bit of reading, writing, and speaking. Lots of inter, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, integrated skill type lessons you can do when you're focusing on stress, which is nice. So we're gonna start from the top, me, then you, same rhythm, adding all those syllables and words, it's gonna keep that same subject, verb, object rhythm. Everybody, first me, then you. Students feel stressed. <laughs> the students feel stressed. I know you're doing it with me. I can't hear it, but I know you're doing it with me. The students are feeling stressed. The students have been feeling stressed. Even more slowly, ready? What, what have the students been, you know, how's the experience been? Oh, studying for this test, the students have been feeling stressed. The students have been. Notice, number one, students. That's the first beat. Down at the bottom, the first beat is the students have been. The students have Five syllables, two syllables. Same space. So when it is fast, of course, it's really hard to understand. Ah, oh, God, the students have been feeling stressed lately. 
Right? The students have been feeling stressed. They've been feeling terrible. They've been feeling, they've been feeling, they've been feeling. But even slowly, I hope you agree, the students have been feeling stressed. It's also, the sounds are different. They're short. They shrink and they link. Speaking of shrinking and linking, do you see where I'm showing you where there is shrinking and linking? Now, discussion here and discussion in, on the course page, class page, how much do we talk about this? You might not want to talk about it. This may just be for you, not your students. This is not my technique. The techniques are coming in a moment. Showing the shrinking and linking might be useful, might not be. Certainly for spelling, it is not useful. So you may want to just take it out, right? Just look at the stress. That's what I'm going to recommend in general. You're going to see when I show you techniques not to highlight the shrinking and linking, to highlight the stress with enough practice naturally that rhythm comes in and the reduced forms become reduced. That's how I feel about it, but there is no perfect right, wrong, black or white when it comes to this stuff. It's time for true or false again. Aren't you excited? True or false? <laughs> Sentence stress changes according to how formal a situation is. Excuse me while I have some coffee. Everybody says yes? Then I made a good question. Now let's see how many falses come. Thank you, Dalel. <laughs> Another trick question. No, iced coffee. I've been running around like crazy today. I, I, I watched, just to tell you a little aside here, uh, I watched 23 Korean teachers demo lessons today. I gave evaluations on 23 lessons. <laughs> they were very short. They were just little um, microcosms of a longer lesson. But uh, demo lessons for Korean elementary school teachers in the United States who are going to Virginia. They're training here at a university. They're going to Virginia to be in elementary schools with uh, young learners. And so they were very nervous, of course. And anyway, I have some pictures I'll put up later. Sentence stress changes according to how formal a situation is. Hmm. Well, what is intonation and what is stress? What is stress and what is intonation? Are they the same thing? Couple examples here where first I have the sentence with no stress marked and then it's marked, partly to illustrate uh, that three beat thing again, so we can see it again, right? Me first, then you. How many people are there in your family? Slower, okay, okay, slower. How many people are there in your family? Everybody, how many people are there in your family? Next one. What are you going to do on Friday? What are you going to do on Friday? And let's take care of the gonna thing right now. <laughs> is gonna slang? Is gonna bad speech? Is gonna colloquial? Well, if you write it, yes. So this is my opinion, but my strong opinion. Native speakers, we don't think gonna. Okay, we have going to that phrasal modal verb up here. We know how to read it. We know how to write it. But when we speak, because it's a modal verb, we don't stress it. It shrinks and links because the main verb is stressed, even with want to and some other verbs, right? Want to go, want to do. When we speak really fast, it's gonna wanna. That might be a little bit, not slang, but informal. Sure. But when we speak in even situations, I'll tell you a story. It's a great story. It's a quick one. We have time, I think. I think you'll like this story. In my master's program, master's in TESOL program at Hunter College in New York City, first year, I had a professor who was, I won't mention her name, but she's a little formal. She was teaching us, uh, not that that's bad, but uh, she was teaching us uh, a lesson, short lesson, kind of like what I saw today, kind of just short lesson um, on will and going to for lower level students, right? So, you know, high beginners or something. And the focus was, you know, when we use will and when we use going to. Okay. 
So at the end of the lesson, or maybe somewhere along the way, it doesn't matter, one of my classmates asked a question. She said, what would you do to help explain the differences in how it sounds in authentic speech, natural speech, you know, gonna? And the professor said, well, because this is a high beginning level, uh, I wouldn't talk about that because, you know, that's colloquial English, kind of informal English. And I think it's much more important to, to focus on, you know, the more standard way of using it. And then she said, okay, everybody, what we're going to do now, I'll never forget that moment. Because here was a formal teacher, professor, who was not even aware that in a formal lecture, she was saying gonna, because everybody says it, right? It's just part of this rhythm we're talking about today. Now, should you write it? Maybe a text message, if you can switch on an essay and write correctly, right? So I don't think the issue is, is right or wrong when we say it. It gets, it's about the spelling idea, right? Now. I'm going to read the first sentence, right? How many people are there in your family? First, I'm going to say it talking on the phone to someone that I know really well, okay? And I want you to think about rhythm and intonation. Rhythm and intonation. Okay, I'm talking to my friend. Uh, I'll say how many people are in her family. I'm talking about someone else. Oh, really? Yeah, cool. Well, how many people are there in her family? Really? She's got a big family. Uh, how many people are there in her family? 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 Right? So we've got the three beats. Everybody agree? I'm speaking quickly. So how many people are there in her family? Right? We got the three. How about the intonation? A little bit of intonation? A lot of intonation? Yeah, cool. All right. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you. How many people are there in our family? Very flat, right? Why is it flat? I thought in English we always use lots of intonation. Why not? Informal. That's right. When we're talking to friends, hey, man, cool. Can I borrow your car? Yeah. All right. All right. I'll be over there. Okay. I'll call you a little bit. All right. All right. Cool. Bye. Friends, why? Intonation signals our attitude, formality, register changes. Intonation is hugely important for this. It's not the same as the stress. Let's look at the second one. Oh, sorry, let me do the first one again, more formal. Oh, so how many people are there in your family? How many people are there in your family? How many people are there in your family? Does the rhythm change, everybody? No. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, sometimes we, how many, how many people are there in your family? How many people are there in your family? How many, how many, yes, we do those changes. I'm not talking about those so much today. I would argue that that's more of an intonation change anyway, not stress. But the rhythm, remember, we're talking about the basic rhythm of English. It's not changing here. The intonation changes to signal what? How many people are there in your family? So how many people are there in your family? It's how formal, how polite, how well we know somebody. I'm talking to my boss. So what are you going to do on Friday? I don't say to my boss, formal. What are you going to do on Friday? Because we change the rhythm to be formal. No, it's the intonation. So what are you going to do on Friday? But to my friend, when I go on my friend, so, I'm a man, my voice is going this high with you. It's crazy. But when we want to be polite as men in English, we don't even realize our voices go really high uh, for requests and more formal things, right? So with my friend, yeah, so what are you going to do on Friday? You want it slower? Okay, so uh, what are you going to do on Friday? What are you going to do on Friday? What are you going to It's the flat. Now, if you're interested with your friends, hey, what are you going to do on Friday? The point is, there are different types of flat intonation. I'm doing it that way because we do talk like that. 
And I have students say, I thought you had so much intonation. And then I hear Americans on the phone. Yeah, cool. All right, I'll call you. Okay, yeah, cool. Bye. <laughs> Sounds like, you know, Asian language or something. That's just with friends. But when we're with people that we don't know as well, that's when we're using all that up and down intonation. Here's a slide to look at that a little bit. And if you're wondering, yes, this actually, this PowerPoint, this slideshow is already uh, in the courseware. So you can check it out, download it. And that will be true of all the materials and we'll even have other uh, another place for you coming up where you'll see some even other materials that uh, the different teachers will put in. So when we talk about register formality, uh, it's intonation. This is a general thing we're talking about. You might find some exception to what I'm saying. I'm speaking very generally. The difference between rhythm and intonation is very important. Maybe for your students to talk about, maybe not, maybe for you to know, and then your techniques that you use are important. So on to the techniques. Technique number one. You've already seen this uh, today because it's a very simple thing. Highlight word and sentence stress. Should you put the shrinking and linking on the other side? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe just the stress. I think this is the last time in this presentation or this uh, slideshow that I show the shrinking and linking. We are not arbitrarily picking out stupid sentences here, right? What would we call this? I think that, feel that, believe that. What would we call that? It's not just some sentences I made up out of, you know, that aren't useful. Expressing opinions. Good. So it's a function, right? We could talk about making requests. We could talk about apologizing, right? So uh, if you're already in a functional syllabus, you already have word banks like this. Or if you're doing something with a topic, the beach. Uh, that's beach, by the way. Um, or, you know, I don't know, computers and technology, whatever, you have opportunities with structures, vocabulary, collocations to put in the stress. You can mark it. You're not sure? You can check dictionaries for syllable stress, word stress, native speakers. Don't ask them to analyze it. Just say, how would you say this? <laughs> uh, because if they start thinking about it, right, then they'll start probably making mistakes, right? So you can just highlight it yourself. Um, that's one, one technique. This is teacher highlighting it. Let's try this. I think this is best. Now you, I think this is best. Me, I believe that it's true. I feel that you can do it. You know what to do. Good. So you could take them, put them into a little chant like I did. Technique number two, students do it. Have students mark stress after a listening task, uh, especially listening comprehension. Practical techniques means almost always with the group of people we have here, you have a curriculum, you have a textbook, you're not gonna bring something else in. Use the material you have because you don't have time to prepare something else maybe, or you have no choice, you have to use what is prescribed in the curriculum. In the case of stress, practicing stress, rhythm, that's actually perfectly all right. You don't need some new material so much. Um, moreover, it can really help to solidify the listening task if after you do listening comprehension. So let's say this is taken, this is sort of high intermediate, low advanced idea here, maybe TOEFL or IELTS or Cambridge, something like that. Um, let's say this comes from something they had to answer questions about. You see, I wrote this uh, yesterday because this is my, my favorite topic. But the students already listen. They already understand this vocabulary. So they're not trying to think, what does regurgitate mean? Okay, they've already done that. That's finished. Okay, I didn't make that very clear in this slide. But that's finished. But you have a little extra time and or you know the students need practice with stress. Right? So you can have them mark it. Just a guess, make it into a game in most cases, right? They mark it, and then you, and I see some ideas here. I know you guys have great ideas uh, for things with this. I've already seen some. Uh, the, my favorite comment, by the way, in the class 
on the class page, and I've seen it a few times, it makes me so happy, is I'm already learning so much from you guys, and I, the class hasn't even started yet. That's what it's all about. So if you can you know, learn all that before the class, come get something from the class, then do a task afterwards, which I'll give you where you can be more creative and think about your own students. I think that's gonna really help you. So everything's understood here. Students know it. And it's not a test. Don't this is not a test. You know, just just guess. You know, which words do you think have the the most stress, right? So what do you think here? Arrows are better for intonation in general. I don't know why it looks like I'm, I'm, I'm playing favorites with Ines, but every time I look down and she's there. Um, there are different techniques for marking it, circling it, underlining it, whatever. What are some words here that you think would be stressed? Don't have to get it perfect. Just which, which words? Memorize, main verb, students. Yeah, especially great has sort of the intonation part of it too, like to... To, for emphasis. Yeah, it sort of sounds like this, right? Da 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 First language speakers, they're not going to get all that re repetition no matter what you do. So helping them a little bit to do it will help. It sounds like Charlie Brown. That's a little bit different sound, John. Um, so that's one technique. Have students mark stress before a listening task to predict where it's going to be. And that's, that's usually better with something a little easier. Uh, or this could be for lower level students a little bit, right? So yeah, prediction is great. Prediction means guessing, means game, right? If you do it right, they feel, they feel like it's fun and they want to know the answers, right? I want to know. I want to check it, right? Like a game, right? Uh, so uh, just to make sure you understand the difference here, because maybe I was, in this case, I didn't mark it here, but they mark it after they've listened. So they listen a bunch of times, then you play it again. And while they're listening, they're marking, right? But in this case, they have not heard the dialogues yet, right? They've never heard this before. So they're imagining what, what it's going to be like, right? And so what do you think for the first one? I will read them aloud, Varvara, absolutely. Yeah. I'll bet we can find a lower price. Everybody, I'll bet we can find a lower price, right? Notice, what do we have? Bet, find, price, right? You might think, but bet is not the subject. You said subject, verb, object. Remember, when you watch this again or look at the PowerPoint, that free beat rhythm, I'm not saying that every sentence is subject, verb, object. I'm saying that's underneath. And here, I'll bet is really the subject idea because we need to get to that meaning of find. If, if we just look at the words that have the stress, they usually communicate enough meaning. You just sound like a caveman or cave person, to be politically correct. Bet, find, price, right? Think, right, right? Uh, from example before, you know, what are you going to do on Friday? If we say, you know, what do Friday, right? I know it's you, right? Those little words like ya, yeah, you becomes ya yeah, because we don't need to know. I know a lot of you know about this because you're right on the class page, right? Let's keep going here. I think you're right, everybody. I think you're right. This plan won't work. This plan won't work. Where's the free beats? Maybe this plan won't work in any way, right? This plan won't work next year, right? So that's sort of fleshing it out. I'm not so sure that's true. Oh, that's. Notice what happened just now. I read that is, but I said that. Now, native speakers, if you ask them to read this, they'll be like, I am not so sure that that is true. <laughs> But naturally, they won't do that. Naturally, they'll see that is, but they're not going to say it. 
I'm not so sure that's true, right? But do we write that's usually? Now for speaking slowly, I'm not so sure that is, right? That is, that is. We don't usually write that's, but it's what we hear. Again, it's not so much formality. I'll be in a, a very formal business meeting. Uh, I'm not so sure that's true. I'm not so sure that's true. Well, I'm not so sure that's true, right? There's nothing about the contraction that is formal here. Now in writing, different story. So if you're telling students very formal writing, try not to use contractions, I'm with you on that, okay? Uh, although you see contractions more and more often in formal writing, but that's a different topic. Uh, how do you feel about it? Everybody, how do you feel about it? Oh, there's a mistake here. Who can find my mistake? I always have at least one typo just to keep you, you know, oh God, I thought I had no mistakes this time. Oh boy, I'll fix the PowerPoint and put it back up. So, yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, okay. I know better. I'm never going to ask for you to tell me my mistake again because I get 40,000 people telling you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, it should say, how do you feel about it? And I was about to explain about do ya, right? Do ya, and why it's so hard to use do. First of all, the do operator doesn't exist basically in any of the languages out there. So why do we need it for questions and, and negatives? But then it's hard to hear, right? It's hard to hear. It's just do ya, do ya. So imagine there's a you there. How do you, right? How do you feel about it? Right? Everybody, how do you feel about it? I don't care either way. I don't care either way. Good. I'll fix that and come back. Technique four. We have five techniques, by the way, and I may give us a little five minutes or ten minute extension here if you don't mind. Focus on stress and reduce speech in dictations. Is dictation a friendly word? Do you like that? <laughs> As a student, you're like, we're going to have a dictation. Take out a pencil and paper. But some of you know, oh, I love some teachers. Well, see, the problem is sometimes teachers love it. Remember, we became teachers. We didn't become something else. So, oh, I love flashcards. I love it. Yeah, well, you're a teacher. <laughs> Remember. Only a small number of those students are going to become teachers. And what about teachers of English? So just because we like dictations and flashcards doesn't mean they like dictations, flashcards. But in the case of dictation, many things are dictations that we don't even think are dictations. So when someone says, I hate dictations, my, one of my favorite things to say is, what about taking a song and taking out some of the words? Have you ever done that? A gap fill, a close exercise, take some words out of a song. <laughs> now, is that a dictation? Of course it's a dictation. Now, if you don't want to call it a dictation because your students will hate you, fine. But I prefer another angle. I like to show how dictations can be incredibly fun they can be like games where you have to listen, try to get it like a puzzle, right? So you can do a lot of different things with dictations. I'm actually thinking if, we, if I do have another class, uh, if I need to substitute for somebody or if we have time, I'd love to do one on dictations. I have many, many, many uh, techniques with dictations. Uh, some of you probably done things like running dictations or shouting dictations. Absolutely amazing. Just Google ESL dictation and you will find a world of different dictations. Uh, this is one of mine um, that I do a lot, and maybe some of you already had a chance to read it because it's been on the screen here so long. Dictate a total of five sentences. Use authentic English. So if it's not you doing it, right, use some audio. If it's you, fine. Make sure you're shrinking and linking, right? You're, you're doing it, giving them authentic rhythm. Repeat each sentence or play it again on the CD or if it's from a excuse me, seen from a, a romantic comedy, a YouTube, whatever you're doing. Repeat each sentence at least three times, giving students time to write. Do not change the speed or stress pattern. Now that's easy if you're playing it from a movie because they're not going to change it. But if you do it yourself, make sure you're not helping them that way. You can help them how. You can repeat it as many times as you want. I said at least three times. You know, don't, no, you've heard it enough. 
Why? They need to hear it again and again, right? Relax, repeat, remember. So keep them nice and relaxed doing this. If they say teacher again, again, in your mind, you can think, ha, 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 again, they're getting it. Because you know they need it again and again and again. So I often talk about this. I'll just throw it in here. It's so important right now. Children, right, little ones, they always want you to repeat, right? Repeat the same song. Repeat the same book 23 times, 1,000 times. Because that's how you have to learn language. Kids are programmed with that. We get older, we think, I understand it, I'm done. You have to give them, right, situations where they're like, can you do it again? Can you play the movie again? Can you play that song again? That's that's my benchmark. If my students, not young learners, right, but middle school and up, if they're saying play it again, do it again, then you got it right, right? You're giving them those multiple exposures in a fun way, like Dr. Nellie D says. And we'll be back soon with the weekly English workout, co-producer, Dr. Nellie Deutsch. Uh, ask students to write down the stressed words first. Oh, I'm being alerted here. I'm going to extend the class by 10 minutes because we're going to do some music. Of course, i got to do some music. Um, I'm going to get to how important music is with rhythm. But how important music is with rhythm? Hello? Rhythm, music. Um, Ask students to write down the stressed words first. This is also very important because if you're giving them a dictation, I'm going to give you an example in a moment, and they are, you know, trying to write down every single little word. Remember, as uh, I think as Ines or someone said earlier, you don't want them to notice all those little words if you're trying to get them to hear those content words that are so important. And later, what can they do? Pair them up. When I do this, even middle school students, adults love this. Slam dunk. Middle school students, you know, even like 11, 12 years old, uh, if you do it right, they really like this because they're trying to find it out. They know you're going to give them the answer and, you know, how close can they get, right? And that's where they can see the grammar that they need to fill in there. Uh, a list of sentences from the students, put them up on the board, you know, blackboard, traditional or overhead or whatever, or have the students come up and write them. Up on the board. Yes, this is a sort of a dictogloss. I love dictoglosses. It is a dictogloss in a sense, although I'm not narrating it the same way that. Uh, well, anyway, in, it, it is a dictogloss. I love I love dictoglosses. It is very much that way, Gordana. And then ask students to highlight the word and sentence stress at the very end, if you want to, right? So that's something we already talked about. I think I have an example here of this. Uh, my favorite one is number three. So I, I, I will I'll, I'll repeat these. We don't have too much time. Well, I'll just do them, and then you can repeat them just to get a feeling for it again. And I think I got I think I hit a lot of the three rhythms here. Uh, but actually, number four you see has an adverb at the beginning with the stress also. So number one, first me then you. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? I want to look at yeses. I just want to see how many we got. Ooh, ooh, ooh. look at that. See, that's that's the kind of thing that just makes me like I, I never want to go into a physical classroom again. When can I? When can we ever have that many people together uh, responding? And uh, it's just amazing. Anyway, plus people that we know in our in our course. Oh, it's just so great. Okay, here we go. Number one. Hmm, what's the weather supposed to be like today? What's the weather supposed to be like today? Notice I'm not doing it too fast, right? Fast, same rhythm, right? So uh, what's the weather supposed to be like today? What's the weather supposed to be like today? But slow. What's the weather supposed to be like today? Today. Supposed to be. He's supposed to be here. She's supposed to know. They're supposed to call. In formal situations, we don't say they're supposed to call. <laughs> It just doesn't happen, and when native speakers do it, it's like weird because we don't talk like that, right? Uh, number two, where do you feel like going for lunch? Where do you feel like going for lunch? Number three is my favorite because if, if I've done this sentence, I do one similar to number three a lot um, to, to really – People that are sort of the non-believers in some of the things I'm talking about today, number three usually gets them because 
the students say, no, 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 it's it's because of idioms I don't understand English. Okay, maybe. It's, it's because of, you know, difficult academic vocabulary or the grammar. Well, look at this sentence number three. Is that difficult vocabulary? Are there any idioms? Any unusual words? But how does it sound? Even slowly. I'm going to do it super slow. Imagine yourself a beginner, you know, low intermediate student listening to this, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a movie or something, right? Tell her we'll meet her around two. What time should we meet her? Hmm. Tell her we'll meet her around two. Yeah, they're thinking bank teller, you know, meter around. What's that like meteorite? Let me check my dictionary. Meter around, meter around. <laughs> yeah, I've had students swear that uh, there's some idiom. That, that there's some crazy grammar structure. Right? It's not the individual sounds. It's the shrinking and the linking. Yeah, no meteors here. <laughs> and when it's fast... As they say in my part of New Jersey, forget about it, right? <laughs> tell her we'll meet her around two. Tell her we'll meet her around two. Yeah, tell her we'll meet her around two. What? Right? So this is a good one, I think. And students, if you want, could you could do a lot of shrinking and linking, right? Tell her, H, gone, shrinks, right? Tell her, that's the right consonant into the vowel sound. All of that shrinking and linking, if you wanted to focus on it, you could. Number four. Actually, is that common, by the way, this uh, sentence adverb? <laughs> oh, my goodness, right? You always have students say, what is that? They're always saying, actually, what is that word? Beginners always say. They always say, what's that word at the beginning? Actually, and then they say, what's that word at the end? Do. You ever got that question? What's that word do I hear? Do, 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 do. What are they talking about? Americans always say, you know, blah, 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 do. La 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 do. Yes, it's though, right? <laughs> and that can be very confusing. Uh, ready? Actually, I think I'll stay at home tonight and watch TV. Actually. Do you want to go out? I thought we were going to go to that party. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think I'll stay at home tonight and watch TV. Notice how slowly. I'm doing it. I don't want anyone saying, oh, well, you know, when he speaks fast, then the rhythm is like this, right? And I should say, you know, I'm referring to American English. Some of these things are similar or different. I'm telling you, anyone who wants to f argue with me about one well, British English, they speak with it more like, eh, no, it's the same thing. They reduce, they shrink, they link. Different sounds reduce different ways, but same thing happens over there, right? This is, this is uh, something that occurs uh, in both, but of course, some different sounds uh, because of the different sound systems that we have in our dialects. Last one. Oh, look, I remembered you, so we can do do ya. I'll fix the other one. Is it do you want to meet? You might think, well, want is like, is a, it's not a modal verb, it's a main verb. Yeah, but it's so common with that infinitive collocation. So, wanna. And you guys know about wanna, right? Look at all my wannas. Wanna, 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 wanna. Is want a slang? No, we don't say, do you want to meet? Do you want to go? Again, doesn't matter how informal or formal the situation is. Now, very fast English is going to be like, do you want to? Do you want to go? Okay, that's informal. <laughs> but we still say want to or want to, not want to, regardless of the register of English. Everybody, do you want to meet at the library tomorrow? I won't snap because you're doing your own speech. But for me, do you want to meet at the library tomorrow? Extension activity? Pretty obvious one, right? Now, you might just do this and you're done. Students write responses and create dialogues or stories. What's the weather supposed to be like tomorrow? It's supposed to rain or I think it's going to be nice. Right? So you could use that if you wanted to as a springboard uh, into dialogues or stories. Last one. 
meaningful shadowing and repetition. By the way, if you're wondering why the class isn't over, I gave us uh, a little bit more time. I may tack on another five minutes. Uh, if you have to leave, that's fine. We're going to do a couple songs where I illustrate the stress in songs. So if you can stay, uh, stay. If not, that's what's great about the recording. Technique five, meaningful shadowing and repetition. Meaningful is a key word here because if you know me and you know I think I can speak for probably every teacher <laughs> that's in this MOOC, it's not a, if you're going to do drilling and shadowing and repeating, uh, it's got to be contextualized or connected to what you're doing, right? Not just some meaningless junk, but some repetition, in my opinion, strong opinion, wow. If without it, it's going to be really hard for anything to stick up there. So uh, I have some ideas here. Can you add to the list? Scenes from movies and TV shows. Stop. Repeat. Maybe look at the subtitles. Try to sound like the speakers. Not thinking so much about any patterns or rules, right? Uh, music videos, commercials, role plays created by students, scenes from plays and musicals, famous speeches, karaoke, poetry, limericks, jokes, tongue twisters, and songs. I used to be one of those guys that worked for uh, those commercials where they have like, and now if you call right now, 1-800-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-
Are you under your regular name? Did you raise your hand? There she is. She should be coming in. Dr. Nelly D. And let's get the music on. Are you there, Dr. Nelly? Yes, you are. I can't see you. I thought I'd enabled you here. No? Hmm. One second. Doesn't look like I gave you the controls. No. But when I saw you up on top, I could. Hmm. All right, let me try something else here. Sorry, everybody. There's just so many people here, and for some reason, I can no longer see your name. Oh! All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come back here. Sorry, this is my stupid fault with the computer I'm using. There's her microphone. There's her camera. You're coming, Dr. Nelly. She is. <laughs> Does everybody see Dr. Nelly D in the place to be? E L T T. Yeah. We're ready to go. We're going to put the music on. The weekly English workout theme song. It's, Here it comes. It's, now tell me. It's, is that too loud? Is that all right? Can you hear it? Come on, Dr. Nelly. Do the Dr. Nelly. It's the weekly English workout with Fluency MC. Stick with me. I guarantee to keep you worry-free. There it is. Indeed, you'll see. The key to speaking is to lower your stress. Having fun when you learn is when you learn the best. Go now and start studying grammar rules and cramming for tests. Give your brain a rest or you might get depressed. All of us are blessed, no matter what our age, to learn a second language when we feel what? Join the English workout, follow the three R's, relax, repeat, remember, it'll take you far. That's right, <laughs> Dr. Nelly, Dr. Nelly's my flavor flave, my kid Capri, my Ed McMahon. Fluency <laughs> All right. I am not in the bathroom, thank you very much. <laughs> Somebody said I was in the bathroom. I go to the bathroom right here. I have a setup, it's custom made. Dr. Nelly Deutsch gave me this catalog for online learning, uh, it's accessories, it's fantastic. Uh, I don't know, I think Dr. Nelly, your dance, it was so powerful, somehow it just disconnected me, it just blew me out of the room. Anyway, I'm back. I did something stupid. Six minutes. We've got one more song I want to do. This is sort of my signature song for this topic. Can everybody see that? What's the name of the song? Now, does anybody know my song? I would be so honored. 
I know a few people know it. I know people like Claudia know it. I know Fatima knows it. I know Vanessa knows it. Anybody else know it? <laughs> Ines knows stick stuck stuck good. All right. If you don't know it, it's even better for me because I'll introduce it to you right now. Uh, these are the lyrics. They are up in our courseware, or if I didn't put them there, I will. I'm going to put on the music. I'm not going to talk about the song because you can already, if you're looking at it, see some of the things we're talking about today. This is great for intermediate students who don't have enough practice uh, with with this uh, these structures and, and vocabulary and stress. Uh, or it could be for lower level students to introduce some things and you could go much more slowly with it. In any case, this is rhyme and rhythm. Mm. Can you hear it? Mm. Check this out. Okay. Rhyme and rhythm. Rhythm and rhyme. Now you. Got to repeat, everybody. Now me. Rhyme and rhythm. Rhythm and rhyme. Now you. I can't hear you. Try this. <laughs> rhyme and rhythm. Rhythm and rhyme. What's the time? It's time to rhyme. Rhyme and rhythm. Right? Rhythm. Everything. What's the time? It's time to rhyme. Good. My name is Jace. What's your name? All right. My name is Jace. What's your name? Dr. D. <laughs> is it Princess Diana? Oh, for Dalel it is. How about Elmo? It's not. Is it George Bush? Are you serious? Then what's your name? Rhyme and rhythm, rhythm and rhyme. I live in New Jersey. Where do you live? Where do you live, everyone? I live in New Jersey. Where do you live? There's an intonation. Oh, Brazil, Mexico, Yemen, Hawaii, Athens. Do you live in the zoo? You must be joking. How about the ocean? What? Is your house on planet Neptune? Of course not. Then where do you live? Run and rhythm, rhythm and run. How does he do that without moving his lips? This is the vocal version. I'm doing it with it. But you can get this yourself and use it. I like to make music. How about you? I like to make music. What do you like to do? Ooh, listen to music. Do you like to do dishes? No, I don't. How about taking tests? Nope. <laughs> do you like to get sick? Tell me, what do you like to do? <laughs> Run and rhythm. Here we go. Run and, and rhythm. rhythm. Rhythm and run. Run and rhythm. Again. Run and, and rhythm. Rhythm, rhythm and run. run. All right. Now it's the hip hop show style. Ready? Now when I say run, you say run. Rhyme, rhyme. When I say time, you say time. Time, time. What's the time? It's time to run. It's time to what? What's the time? It's time to run. It's time to what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, that was fun. All right. Let me, uh, oh, I hope I don't disappear again. I hope you can still see me. Mm -hmm. I'm having some uh, DJ issues. Okay. Run and rhythm. DJ. Rhythm and run. Now you. We'll just turn the speaker down. Because <laughs> I don't want to disappear again. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. Oh, thank you for the claps, the bravos. I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much.
It's great to do this live in front of so many people. Tom is here. Our e friends here. Marielle is here. Since the people I haven't said hello to yet. Elena. Safa. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, pretending just to say hello. I just want to see all those claps. No. Uh, yeah, so this song, you could see, I hope, how we're trying to take a focus on rhythm and stress, but that's not just what we're doing, right? All kinds of stuff is happening in this song. What's happening in this song? We're learning about rhyme and rhythm, but what else? Interaction. Specifically, what are we practicing here? Anything you see with verbs, WH questions? Intonation, right? What's your name, not my name, right? That contrast. Good. How about functionally? What are we doing? What's the, what are the functions here? Questions. A little bit more. That's more of the structure. What are, let me give you a little more of the function. I'm waiting for that real informal. Okay, that's the register. Likes. Okay, the, uh, expressing likes and dislikes. Preferences, good. Introductions, Faye said, hi, Faye. I didn't say hello to Faye yet. So, uh, introducing yourself, basic conversational stuff, you know, expressing where you live, that kind of thing, right? Good. All right. So, I'm glad you like it. I have lots more songs like this. I'll be doing um, at least one class just focusing on using uh, songs. Um, so, glad you could come today. I have to, uh, I'll use the last couple minutes and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. Uh, I had a great time. You guys are amazing. This has been a really wonderful class. Uh, part of the reason I think this class has been so wonderful is because of what happened in the on the class page. We're off to a great start, fantastic start, with people exchanging ideas there, then coming into the class today. The next step is I'm going to give you a post-class task. And if you're wondering, what is this going to be? Oh, my God. You're getting stressed out about it. Please don't. It's going to be very, very simple. I can tell you right now, since you're still here, those are here, what, what we're going to do. But basically, it's take any of the techniques that I mentioned or any other technique that you know about and create your own activity or mini lesson for your group of learners. Or if you're not a teacher yet, you're training, you know, you imagine the group and you try to think of some way that's more your style or taking something from your curriculum, you know, what you have to teach. How could you put a focus on stress that would be fun and engaging and help students uh, improve their skills. So that, that's the basic idea. Uh, most of the post-class tasks are going to be that of that nature, not exactly that way. But anyway, uh, you don't have to write any of this down. I'm going to uh, put that in courseware. Uh, Sylvie and I are going to explain how where you are going to put your responses. They are not going to go in WizIQ, and they are not going to be emailed. No more emailing. We've got a better idea. Uh, so uh, I will uh, very soon after this class. So if you go to the course feed, where is the post-class task? It's not going to be there right away. A lot of people are going to watch this recording. Um, and you also need to check out the next pre-class task for Drew's class, which is uh, my time tomorrow night, Japan, Friday morning. So I'm going to put that up too, okay? So we want to have, uh, there's a lot of stuff going, it's going to be going up. So it won't come right now, but it will be available soon. I promise you, you will see it. You will get a notification in courseware. Um, you will see it there. Uh, when I would say, I'm going to go schedule Drew's stuff, put his things up. So let's say, you know, before midnight tonight, that's my time. So that's six hours from now. Anyway, something like this. Okay. And you'll see the post-class uh, task. And you can do that at any time you want uh, during the class. I never stop. Yeah, that's true. I was talking to Sylvia about that. <clears throat> Sylvia and I and, and Nelly uh, are, are, I think, really this time going to uh, really get this move going. And it's exciting. So it's kind of like, do you stop and get excited? Uh, you know, do you rest? Uh, no, you keep going. You're excited and you keep going. Uh, tomorrow, no class. Well, there is a class. Tomorrow there is class. Uh, it depends where you live. It might be Friday morning for you, uh, but there is a class. Uh, it's not officially scheduled yet. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, it is on the schedule. The schedule from now until the end of our course is very fixed. I don't think we're going to change it unless there's a problem. So check out the PDF file in courseware for the class schedule. That is the schedule. Now, 
I haven't officially scheduled the class. So if you say, I didn't get anything yet, that's right. I'm going to do that right now. I'm doing it a little bit slowly at first until we get into the rhythm of it. Ah, the rhythm. Uh, the times, I know people say, oh, not this time, not this time. It doesn't work like that. Presenters pick the time because that's going to give you the best uh, class at the best time for them. Recordings of classes are going to be fine. And also remember, if it's a bad time for you, it's probably a good time for someone else. And we want to balance that out. Anyway, we got 55 seconds. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye from wherever you are, whatever time it is. Oh, Susan Dixon's here. I know Susan. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. You're really making it up. Oh, there's that darn phone again uh, that I won't answer. Uh, I'm so glad to see Demetrius here. Demetrius is Club EFL. He's the one that's been working with Sylvia. This is his, his platform we're going to use. Very exciting. You're welcome, Vanessa. <laughs> High energy forever. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Have a good night or a good day wherever you are. Thank you so much for being a part of ELT Techniques, ELTT. Please tell your friends, your colleagues, we are open. We will stay open. So come on in. Tell them to come on and join us, and they can work at their own pace. Peace and much respect.